Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the June 7th, 2017 meeting of the Frederick County Planning Commission. And I ask that you join us in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. We have an agenda to adopt. Madam Chairman, move for adoption of the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? April 19th, 2017, minutes of the meeting. Move for adoption of the April 19th minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. All, all opposed? Under committee reports, uh, Mr. Unger has got uh, the preponderance of what we have available for us tonight, and he will, um, uh, first of all, uh, talk about the Frederick County Sanitation Authority. Okay, Sanitation Department, we met May the 9th, and I got a report of the budget for 2018 uh, for the capital improvement plans. Uh, let me see how much money it was. What they're going to do for the first part of um, the year for 2018, they want to do the 37 water line loop coming, coming down 37 to connect the water lines together so they'll have better pressure. Uh, they want to do a 522 sewer redistrict and force main, and the first phase of that will be funded <coughs> with availability fees. And then they want to do, if I can find it, uh, starting the Opecan water plant, get it up and running for the, this year, not up and running, but get it going for this part of the year. That's for 2018. And they're having some... Uh, increase in fees and basically what's going to happen it's a 15% uh, increase on the cost of water we're paying Winchester right now so we're going to have to go up our fees a little bit on that the Winchester went up 15% for the water and car moose went up 15% as of July 1 so we'll be paying for more water from car moose from the quarry down there and they have increased 155 percent since 2013 so sanitation has done real well in keeping the price of the water down compared to what we're paying for it down there and this is a 25 million dollar debt for the energy the Peckin water Rec reclamation facility uh, the town of stephen city still owes frederick county 202.5 million dollars and we're trying to get that resolved as soon as possible uh, water rates are going to go up. It's going to impact about 93% of the customers for residential. Their water rates are only going to go up 3%, which is only going to affect them 5 or $6 for a billing. So that's not going to affect real bad for them. What is going to go up is commercial and industrial. Uh, what, basically what that is is a larger water meter, and they're going to go up between 7 and 30%, depending on the size of the meter. So we should see a little bit of a, a little more of an increase in some of our money there for the water. And that's about it for sanitation department. Thank you, sir. Uh, for transportation, we've got a pretty lengthy thing on that tonight and our report was basically what that's gonna be. So we're gonna be talking about that later on. Oh. Same thing for uh, DRS. Uh, We've got that on tonight's agenda also, so I'm just re repeating myself if I said anything about it, so. Thank you, thank you for what you've done. Um, uh, we are on to the citizen comment portion. Uh, that's the time when, uh, if you'd like to speak to us regarding anything that's not on the agenda, we open that up. And it's also the time uh, when, and it, there is in this case, there are three if you will, um, discussion sessions that the commission has is doing, and that's for ourselves only. And if anyone is here to talk to one of the discussion items, and I believe we had we had uh, a person to do that, now is the time to come forward, if you will, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Jeremy Tweedy. I'm here on behalf of Greenway Engineering as an engineer, as a citizen of the Shawnee, uh, Shawnee Magisterial District, and as a representative for small infill lot developments within Frederick County's urban development area. 
with the, um, here to speak specifically about the residential separation buffer and the RP districts item nine and the information discussion item this evening. While the text amendment language as proposed before the commission this evening is needed to accomplish a particular goal for developments, it does not accomplish a specific goal for small infill lot developments within the county's urban development area. Um, please take into consideration the following additions and or revisions to the proposed text amendment to be forwarded to the Board of Supervisors for discussion. The addition <coughs> and or modification would read as follows. The zoning administrator may waive, reduce, and or modify the residential separation buffer required by section 165.203.C.1 between different housing types, provided that the owner of the adjoining buffer or, uh, sorry, the owner of the adjoining property or properties provide written and notarized consent of the proposed modification to the required residential zoning uh, separation buffer. This would allow for small and fill lot developments that are constrained by space or other factors to pursue a waiver request to the required residential separation buffer. In turn, this waiver request would allow for the opportunity for small infill lot developers to work with the county and the adjacent property owners to achieve a buffer scenario that would be mutually beneficial to the development and to the adjoining properties that have future development potential. I respectfully request this consideration uh, to the modification to the language this evening to be forwarded to the board and or your um, agreement to send it back to the Development Re Review Committee for further discussion. Uh, thank you for your time <coughs> and the opportunity to provide comment. Thank you. Is there anyone else since we... Um, I'll back up. Is there anyone else who would like to speak regarding this item? Anyone else? Thank you. Forgive me. I've neglected to <laughs> speak to uh, not only a member of our Board of Supervisors, but also Mark Lauren with the Winchester City Council. Would you Th come yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Let uh, us know what you're doing. At our last business meeting on the 16th of June, we had two conditional use permits uh, one for a ground floor residential uh, unit on uh, North Lown and, and one for a uh, 147 North restaurant to extend their hours. Both of those were approved by the Planning Commission to go to the City Council. Our next meeting is on the 20th of June. We'll have one conditional use permit, and that's for a neighborhood convenience establishment on Valley Avenue. And then we'll also have one public hearing to amend nine sections of our zoning ordinance. We're just cleaning up some, some language in the ordinance. That's it, thank you. Thank you for being here. And Ms. McCann Slaughter from the Board of Supervisors. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the Board of Supervisors met on um, Wednesday, May the, the 10th, and we considered two conditional use permits, um, the first one being for Virginia Preferred Properties, an indoor commercial recreation private gym facility on which the Board approved. <coughs> um, secondly, the conditional use permit number 06-17 for Thomas E. Jeffries for an indoor commercial recreation softball training facility. The board also approved that conditional use permit. Additionally, um, the board considered um, and had discussion on the replacement of the Clearbrook Convenience Center and approved moving forward with the site design process. At our Wednesday, May 24th meeting, um, the board considered a conditional use permit for Chantel, uh, Shenandoah Mobile LLC for the Bowman Library and denied the above um, conditional use permit. We also considered the ordinance amendment <coughs> to the Frederick County Code Chapter 165, um, Article 1, conditional use permits um, regarding parking buffers um, and for specific uses, Part 204, and commercial shooting and archery ranges outdoor edition section 165-204 special event facilities um, in the agricultural and residential districts. The um, board also approved the um, above ordinance. And lastly, um, we considered the ordinance amendment to the Frederick County Code 
um, for agricultural and residential districts, RA districts for setback requirements, um, a revision to the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance, and on the reduction of the required setback. The board also approved um, that amendment as well. We also um, had a work session with the Winchester Regional Authority and heard the presentation from Delta Associates regarding proposed strategic marketing and business plan for the Winchester Regional Airport. And that concludes my report, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to us regarding nothing that's on the agenda? Okay. We're going to go into our first public hearing, and that is rezoning 03-17 for Rutherford Crossing, submitted by Green Greenway Engineering to rezone 22.16 acres from the M1 Light Industrial District to the B2 Business General District, with proffers in 27.07 acres of land zone M1 Light Industrial District with proffers to the M1 Light Indus <coughs> Industrial District with revised proffers. The property is located, um, excuse me, is fronted on the southeast side of Market Street and north side of Milton Ray Drive in the Stonewall Magisterial District and is in identified by property identification number 43-A-99. Mrs. Perkins. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. As you stated, this is an application to rezone a little over 49 acres from the M1 district to the B2 and M1 districts with proffers. Specifically, 22.16 acres of that M1 is being proposed to be rezoned to the B2 district with proffers, and then the remaining 27 acres is proposed to still remain M1, but with revised proffers. Now, I would note that the property was originally zoned in 2001 and revised in 2004 and 2007. If I can direct you to the screen to your left. Uh, this is the location map for the property. <coughs> the subject pro property is outlined in black in this area here. And for reference purposes, you have Martinsburg Pike and then the remaining area of the Rutherford Crossing Shopping Center. Now the subject property is located within the limits of the sewer water service area as well and is also located within the Northeast Land Use Plan of the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Now the Comprehensive Plan identifies the property with an industrial land use designation which is uh, reflective of the current M1 zoning. Now this is a graphic showing what's adopted in the Northeast Land Use Plan. As you can see, the Rutherford Crossing area, which is the commercial area of that, is in orange, and then the remaining, shown in blue, reflective of the existing zoning. Now staff would note that the property is adjacent to commercial on two sides and residential on one side. I would note that that residential is shown in the Northeast Land Use Plan as uh, future plan commercial. So therefore the request for a portion of that property to be rezoned to the B2 district could be acceptable. And I would note that the remainder of the site, which is located on the opposite side of the Winchester and uh, Western Railroad line is planned to remain existing M1. Now the proffers associated with this rezoning are consistent with the obligations from the past rezoning. Specifically, it still accounts for the 1.2 million square foot building cap, the dedication of Route 37, the requirement for a TIA for any future site plans that exceed the 26,652 trip count for the entire Rutherford Crossing development. And the applicant is also proffering a monetary contribution of 10 cents per building square foot to fire and rescue. So with that, following the public hearings, staff is seeking a recommendation from the Planning Commission to forward to the board. I would be glad to answer any questions, and Mr. Evan Wyatt with Greenway Engineering is here. Thank you. Questions of Mrs. Perkins? Don't see any. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wyatt? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Members of the Commission, Evan Wyatt with Greenway Engineering. Um, Candace has done a good job of covering the, the uh, aspects of the rezoning. <clears throat> the only thing I'd like to add to it uh, regarding the comprehensive plan, uh, when we both looked at it, uh, she's correct. It, it, it reflects the current zoning, uh, which is perfectly acceptable for the comp plan. However, when you look at the, uh, when you look at the 
parcels <coughs> in and around Rutherford Crossing that have developed commercially. Um, this is primarily uh, the best <coughs> land bay for development. And you can see uh, the size and the scale of that area, the 22 acres is primarily this and this, what's in checkered. Um, if, if you think about that for an industrial application, um, the, the depth of the land bays that are usable are roughly about 300 to 350 feet. And the M1, you lose 75 feet in the front and 25 feet in the rear, so you've also diminished your lot that size. Uh, but more importantly, if you look at some of the larger commercial uses, such as the uh, Target store, which is here, which is about 115 to 117,000 square feet, you couldn't place something of that size on the property and still accommodate parking and truck access for delivery. Um, so if it can't accommodate a mid-sized big box, it's certainly not gonna be able to accommodate an industrial type use. Uh, so for this side of the railroad track, uh, the commercial zoning we believe is appropriate. Um, other than that, as Candace pointed out, uh, the proffers that have carried through from the development of the project over the last 16 years are still intact, primarily the uh, dedication commitment for a 300 strip corridor for Route 37, as well as the interchange ramps uh, that would go through the portions of the rear property. Um, but if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Questions of Mr. Wyatt? Okay. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Just a quick one. I noticed that you, uh, you offered a monetary contribution for fire and rescue. With the change from light industrial to general business, wouldn't that also impact the police a lot more than a uh, industrial? So wouldn't it be appropriate maybe to think about giving them something too? Um, the County Sheriff's Department. The, I guess the, the expectation over time of rezonings, Mr. Thomas has been to support the, the fire and rescue. Um, I haven't really seen a movement on other zoning applications for the sheriff's office. Um, and once again, we've, we've tried to mirror what have been done with other commercial and industrial rezonings, which is the 10 cent a square foot. Uh, so we believe it's appropriate. Anyone else? Just for, <laughs> Madam Chair, just for my yes. clarification, Evan, uh, the, the M1 parcels that were rezoning M1 were just revised in proffers? Yeah, what, what we're doing, uh, um, Kevin, is of course, the whole thing is 40 some acres. This back portion will retain its M1 zoning. Uh, Route 37 corridor primarily comes through this part of the property. And then there is a section that goes through here for ramping. Uh, for access to Interstate 81. So there's gonna be a portion of this that remains M1. All this would be rezoned to the B2. Um, this back portion of the property is primarily in floodplain. So the usable area is really this kind of L shape, uh, which is bisected by Market Street, which serves as access to the FEMA building. Gotcha, but why we have to go, if we're, what are we rezoning? What is the, we well, what here? we're rezoning, What's in the checkered portion of is the, the- Is the, go to B2, but the, we're going M1, but you also have the other parcel, I thought I read where it's M1 to M1. Is that well, how I'm reading that? Yeah, the, the M1 stays the same. The reason the, the, the application reads M1 and B2 is because the proffers have been revised okay. from the previous M1 rezoning, so you're capturing everything with the proffers. Go through the process again, mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anyone like to speak to this uh, rezoning of Rutherford Crossing? Anyone? All right, we will close the public hearing. Any comments, thoughts, conversation? Uh, I'll throw out one comment before I make a motion then. Uh, there's about seven properties, residential properties up along Route 11 uh, before this gets to the Board of Supervisors, Mr. White, if your clients would uh, entertain the notion of maybe providing a 20-foot sewer easement across the back of those, so if they have failing drain fields, they have an access to public sewer. Uh, appreciate if you would explore that with your clients. And if there's no other 
conversation. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Party, Mr. Unger. Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Daniel, yes. Brian, yes. Oates, yes. Thomas, yes. Bolden, yes. Kenny, yes. Triplett, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes yes. This goes to the Board of Supervisors on July the 12th. Thank you. Okie doke. Our next item is also a public hearing item. It is a draft of the up of the 2017-18 Frederick County primary and second and primary <coughs> and interstate road improvement plans. It also is partnered with a public hearing for the um, uh, public to comment on the proposed six-year plan for the Frederick County secondary roads for fiscal year yep. 2018. And this is coming to us from the Transportation Committee and Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, <coughs> members of the commission. As you noted, this is our annual update of our interstate primary and secondary plans. The secondary <coughs> being the only plan that's a code requirement, which is why it has its own public hearing requirements. <coughs> if I may begin with the interstate, interstate road improvement plan, of course, with only one interstate, it is our simplest plan <laughs> of the three, um, and it has not changed uh, from last year. We continue to call for the widening of I-81, including um, additional safety and operational improvements of exit 310, since we've only done phase one of a three-phase project. Um, and, excuse me, uh, a more significant widening um, through, the, through the central portion of I-81 in the county. Moving on to the primary road, imp road improvement plan. We had a number of changes last year, uh, which continue to be <coughs> reflected. You may recall that we added in Route 7, Route 50, uh, because uh, modeling does call for widening of those areas to six lanes. However, the primary change for this year is uh, regarding Route 37 to push for phase two of exit 310 since phase one is nearing its completion. Uh, since there's been so much work going on down there, I regularly have to remind folks that that's still just step one of a much larger project as we progress toward a full clover leaf of that interchange. Mm -hmm. Although I think we're all happy to see that the current phase is nearing completion. It's been uh, quite a ride for many of us and I know a lot of folks drive through there on a daily basis that are happy to see it coming to an end uh, for the time being anyway. With that, I will move on to the secondary road improvement plan. As noted earlier, this is code required and uh, each year we have to hold a public hearing on it. Uh, to begin with, we have the uh, major road improvement projects. Those are items such as Sulphur Springs Road. Sulphur Springs Road, um, all of our revenue sharing projects are reflected on there, as well as some smaller items such as uh, uh, some partial allocation on Redbud Road that's been used for some design of, the, of that relocation. Uh, the county's actually done some additional work on that independently. Uh, Town Run Lane, some minor improvements, and Carpers Valley Road, you'll see reflected at number seven, the federal bridge replacement dollars that are on that project. And finally, to the most popular part of the secondary road improvement plan, and that is uh, the unpaved or, or rather we changed it to non-hard surface road improvement projects a couple of years ago. Uh, leading off that list, we have projects that were already on there from last year, Carter, Carter Lane, Pack Horse Road, both segments of Laurel Grove Road and Hollow Road, as well as uh, North Sleepy Creek Road. We did have some funds um, as determined by VDOT projections to promote a couple of roads. So what we did is what we do every year per, per board policy is update the, the rankings of all the roads that had not yet been scheduled. That led to Babs Mountain Road and Old Baltimore Road being promoted. It's worth noting they were at the top of the list last year. They remained at the top of the list this year after we uh, rechecked and put them back through the scoring system. And so those were moved forward and you see those are projected out there in 2022 and 2023. Although VDOT tells me those are fairly conservative projections, that's where they are right now. This is a six year plan. Finally, we have the unscheduled list, which is our, our longest list, unfortunately. Um, we have 20 projects currently on the unscheduled list. 
Uh, we would have dropped to 19 ex because we did not add any new projects. However, what we did do, um, per the request of the residents in that area, as well as the recommendation of the Transportation Committee, is split Mount Olive Road into two segments to see if perhaps the, er the segment that is um, that comes first, rather, uh, from the already paved section back to Hammock Lane would score a little higher. And it did, but not significantly enough to uh, put it into a location where it would have gotten funded this year. So you see Mount Olive Road at numbers 18 and number 20. However, the rest of the projects are as they were shown last year. With that, I know that was a, a rather rapid fire summary of, of the three plans. Of course, I can take any questions you may have. Yes, questions of Mr. Bishop. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Would anyone in the audience like to speak to, uh, regarding these, these updates? Anyone at all? If you come forward, please. <coughs> And if you don't mind, would you give us your name and magisterial district, yeah. please? Yep. My name is Karen Olson, and I live on Laurel Grove Road, which is on the non-hard surface road improvement projects. Um, I'm not here so much to complain about not getting our road paved till 2021, but my husband and I just like to make sure that we have an open communication so that we can make sure that if we continue to have problems with our road because it is not paved, we have some horrible potholes from time to time. And in the past, I have written to uh, Balders uh, Mr. Balderson, and, and I don't see him here today, but I, because he was with VDOT, I believe. We were, my husband and I are fairly new here, so this is only my second time at one of these meetings. We were here in November, and that was how I got Mr. Balderson's name. but. We just like to keep an, uh, an open communication, open line of communication, because we did let him know in the past about issues we were having with the road when the, the, the washboard got very bad, the potholes got very bad. Last week, a part of our road was falling into a gully, uh, but we, we did have somebody out recently and, and work on that. And I, I like to maintain a, a, a line of communication because I actually thanked him in the past when things were done on our road. And, and although our road isn't going to be, our portion of the road isn't going to be paved till 2021, we just want to make sure we continue to get that maintenance done and, and we can have somebody that we can talk to when it needs to be done because sometimes it does go <coughs> a long time between. That's all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Is there anyone else who would like to address us? regarding this update. Well, seeing no other, uh, we will make a decision to send this on to the Board of Supervisors, I would suspect. Would anybody like to make a motion? Uh, moving forward this to the Board of Supervisors. <coughs> Second. 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 Yeah. Moon, yes. Dunlap, yes. Triplett, yes. Kenny, yes. Molden, yes. Thomas, yes. Oates, yes. Karn, yes. Badger, yes. Ambrosia, yes. Marston, yes. Hungry, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This will go to the board on uh, June the 14th. All righty. The next item is a public hearing item, and it is an ordinance dealing with the uh, zoning category. And basically, if I could just summarize it, these are revisions to the Frederick County Zoning Ordinance on medical offices in the RP residential performance and the RA rural areas district as a conditional use. Mr. Klein. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. This is a public hearing item for a proposed text amendment to chapter 165 of the zoning ordinance to add medical offices as a conditional use in the RP residential performance in RA rural areas zoning district. Staff has drafted an amendment to include medical offices as a conditional use in the RA and RP zoning districts. We've also drafted additional supplemental use regulations that pertain to medical offices. Supplemental use regulations may include um, B2 district park adherence to B2 district parking and design standards. The use must front and be 
and be accessed via a collector or arterial roadway. The primary use of the structure shall be for a doctor's office. The use shall not be located within a residential development or subdivision and buffer and screening requirements may be determined um, by the zoning administrator. We also would note that additional requirements could be added during the conditional use permit process if necessary. The Development Review and Regulations Committee discussed this amendment at their January 2017 meeting, and this item was presented to the Planning Commission in March. It went to the Board of Supervisors in April and again in May. Following a public hearing this evening, staff is seeking a recommendation from the Planning Commission to forward the item to the Board of Supervisors. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Clint? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm supportive of this because I think there's areas, particularly all around Gore, or out towards uh, the summit and some other areas, we have some larger RP lots and RA lots where a dentist or doctor may want to open closer to the community out in the western part or along some major highways. Uh, one thing I had a question of was under the supplementary use, the buffer and screening shall be determined by the zoning administrator. Since this is a conditional use permit, uh, wouldn't that just be part of the conditions rather than having a buffer and screening under that part of it as well? Uh, it could be, um, obviously they would need to adhere to the B2 district and parking, the B2 design standards, and they'd also need to do a zoning district buffer. It would give the zoning administrator additional leeway should we determine that the property may have an impact on an adjoining lot that we could request additional buffering or screening as, as deemed necessary. So that would be above and beyond what would be brought at the conditional use time. We, um, in other it, words, if we determined we wanted additional screening, would the zoning administrator then have the ability to waive what was put on the condition? Uh, it would be as included as an additional con condition as necessary. If you wanted to do something extra, that would be added as a condition during the approval process. Okay, I'm just used to seeing as it, as it come in for conditional use permit that we, as a condition, we spell out what we want in the way of buffers at that time for the neighbors since Correct. they're here at a public and, hearing. And I think the inclusion of that supplemental use would be something above and beyond what the B2 district and the buffer and landscaping parts of the zoning ordinance would already require. That's why that, that's included there. Okay, it, it just seemed like we were throwing out a double whammy on buffers there. That's not, that's not the intent, but if it's taken that way, um, we'd be happy if you would like to amend it as part of your motion, we'd be happy to, we can take that out of there if you'd like. All right, appreciate it. Yes, Mr. Moan. Uh, Tyler, I, I agree. I, I'm generally uh, supportive of this. I would be supportive of any change if that were to come forward on the motion with that particular um, standard. But I think one thing that would be helpful potentially is to understand beyond this kind of just being a general change to the ordinance and potentially a more flexibility. What was the genesis uh, for this amendment? Have, have we been seeing more inquiries for folks out in different parts of the county that are underserved? We were approached by an individual who would like to open a chiropractor's office in a property that's zoned RA or rural areas. Uh, that was the impetus for the change. Um, subsequent to working with that individual and taking it to the committee, we've received several other inquiries to the um, county administrator's office where people are seeking to open doctor's offices in areas that they would otherwise not be allowed currently. Um, right now, you'd have to be in the in a business zone district. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Any other questions, Mr. Klein? Well, I, I will throw out one other thing. Well, I'm supportive of this. Uh, I would not be supportive of seeing this come in, say, in the middle of Canada Estates on a quarter acre lot. Uh, I guess this if you are getting requests, uh, yeah, seeing those pop up in the middle of a, a smaller subdivision just sure. wouldn't fly with me. This would only be on some larger lots out in the area. And again, touching back on the supplemental use regulations, uh, the use must front on a collector or arterial roadway, and the primary use of the structure must be a doctor's office, and they would be, uh, they shall not be located within a residential development or subdivision. So th those kind of checks would make ensure that it wouldn't um, pop up in a subdivision or something to that extent. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Just, Unger. Just a comment, and I'm trying to 
see what Gary's saying. I sort of agree with him, but thinking about it too, if it's a doctor's office, chiropractor, whatever it may be, I doubt you're gonna see over two or three vehicles there at one time anyway. So it's probably not gonna be, ex I shouldn't say that, but it shouldn't be real extensive. I would agree with that on a chiropractor, but on a dentist office, if he's got, I mean, one dentist generally runs three or four chairs at a time. Right, I would so agree. That'd be a lot of traffic running out of some of these areas. So I'd like the idea of it being case by case on a CUP. I agree with you. Case by case on a CUP, and additionally, uh, depending on the site, we'd likely require a site plan, depending on where it was located. That would add another level of review where entities like VDOT, the health department, sanitation authority would get to provide comment on the uh, proposal. In addition to they providing, com they would be providing comments in the conditional use permit process as well. I don't want to put somebody out of business, but I don't want to affect neighbors to where it's going to be a problem either. Well, as part of the conditional use permit process, uh, it would require a public hearing before the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Adjacent property owners would be notified via a certified letter and a sign would be posted on their property. So there would be ample opportunity from input from adjacent properties in the surrounding community if there were objections or anything to that extent that could be taken into consideration by the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Thomas, can you? Yeah, back to the earlier comment on the buffers and screening uh, being determined by the zoning administrator. I think this would be the first time that we've had something with a conditional use permit that after it left the planning commission and the board that the zoning administrator would have the ability to change what was in that conditional use permit. And I think that's kind of a slippery slope to start going down. I don't have a good wording for you and I understand what you're saying there, but that should be determined before it comes to the planning commission, not after it. It would be included in the processing of the conditional use permit. It would not necessarily be something that was added. Subsequent to that, by going through this process, these, would, these supplemental use regulations would be included in the conditions, most likely. Okay. I just wouldn't want to have somebody have the idea, some applicant have it, the idea that, well, once I get it through the planning commission and the board, I'll go try to sweet talk the zoning administrator and uh, see if I can get those changed. So. Well, at the very least, they would be meeting the district and design standards. This would be for something above and beyond the current standard. So they'd have to meet the minimum, but in cases where additional screening was warranted, that would give the zoning administrator a leeway to ask for something above and beyond what the ordinance already required. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Is there one, anyone in the audience who would like to speak to us regarding <coughs> this, this conditional use permit? Anyone at all? All right, we'll close the public comment portion. Yeah, oh, sir. <laughs> Could I ask our uh, county attorney if he's uh, comfortable with that uh, E buffers and screening? Certainly, uh, there's two possible approaches to this and I think what we have is a sentence that's trying to do, or maybe trying to do one or both. Uh, one, one question presents itself where as a condition of the CUP, the commission and the board has said that it should have conditions X, Y, and Z and I think the point of a couple of the commissioners tonight is, is that the zoning administrator shouldn't be able to undo that. But there's also the circumstance where there might be other buffer or screening conditions that are already in the ordinance that may conceivably not be most appropriate for the use and that the intent of E was to allow the zoning administrator to fix that problem. Uh, that said, I think we need a clarification based on what's written. Um, because if it's that confusing now, it's not going to be less confusing later. Agree. Yeah. Mr. Thomas? Mr. Holtz? Uh, Mr. Williams, on uh, A of that section, where it says it has to meet the design standards of B2, doesn't that already take into account the buffer and screening under E? That is at that point? Uh, yes, it does. I mean, 
every property is different, but ideally the ordinance tries to address as broad a set of circumstances as possible up front. And there it is. A says it's supposed to meet B2, but E says, well, we'll let the zoning administrator decide. I think we should strike E, personally. <laughs> I think it's I gonna agree with you. I think we've, all, we've, we've overstepped, or we're, st I agree with Mr. Thomas that we're on a slippery slope here. We're, we're getting away from what the intent of, with the conditional use permit, and we're getting away from what we wanted to do to serve that individual or individuals that want to open that type of business out there. And I, we're putting, we're layering on a lot here, it seems like, uh, to put it just in general layman terms, we're layering on a lot of items here. Anyone else? Uh, I'll make a motion to send this on to uh, the Board of Supervisors for approval uh, with the elimination of uh, item E under 165-204 part three. Second. 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 Any other discussion? Okie doke. Mr. Unger? Unger, yes. Marston, yes. Ambrogi, yes. Manuel, yes. Karn, yes. Holmes, yes. Thomas, yes. Bolden, yes. Kenny, yes. Triplet, yes. Dunlap, yes. Moon, yes. And the chair votes, yes. This goes to the board on July the 12th. Our next item is a discussion item, and it is um, it deals with the increase in the permitted number of employees for a cottage occupation. These revisions to the ordinance would be uh, to increase to increase the n number of employees for a cottage occupation. Mr. Klein. Yes, good evening again. This is the first of three items that are up for discussion this evening by the Planning Commission. This is a proposed amendment to Chapter 165, the zoning ordinance, to increase the permitted number of employees for cottage occupation uses. As you all are aware, a cottage occupation is a profession carried out in a residential dwelling unit or accessory building with only one employee other than members of the family residing on the premise are permitted. Staff has drafted a revision to the zoning ordinance to allow for up to two employees as part of the cottage occupation. Again, that would be two employees beyond the members of the family that are currently residing on the premise. The Development Review and Regulations Committee discuss, discussed this amendment at their December 2016 meeting, and the DRRC agreed with the proposed changes and recommended that the item be forwarded to the Planning Commission for discussion. This item is presented this evening for discussion, and staff is seeking any comments from the Planning Commission to forward to the Board of Supervisors. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Any comments? Yes. I, I just have one uh, existing conditional use permits that are out there that limit them to one, will this automatically allow them to go to two or they have to come back in for revision? They'd have to come back in for a revision because all of our conditional use permit applications include a provision that any change or expansion of the use would require a new CUP. Um, for some clarification, not every CUP or not every cottage occupation seeks to have two employees and in our evaluation of the CUP, we, can, we could impose a condition that said it would be limited to only one employee depending on certain circumstances. So this doesn't preclude us from limiting the number of employees, but it would allow up to two additional employees beyond those people residing on the premise. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Dunlap. Um, I've, I've got some problems with this. Um, the, my understanding of the cottage uh, the cottage occupation is really a, a, a small business, a very small business. But what I see in this is a is a creep of more intensity, and I don't think that follows through with the original intent of the cottage occupation. Um, we just talked about a, a change where you know allowing medical offices and and the RA and RP, and we've had some previous cases come through here with, uh, with child care with a lot of kids. And so I, I think there's a trend here, and, and I, I have a problem with this. I don't know that I could support, uh, I could see one other person, uh, 
But I think two is just starting to getting to get beyond what the intent of a cottage occupation is. Any other comments <clears throat> for Mr. Klein? Yes, Mr. Yeah, Thomas. I tend to agree there because we're going to be, you know, if if you have one person, you have one additional car. Two people, you have two additional cars. Then okay. if you have people coming in to get services there, you have additional cars <coughs> coming in. So you've doubled the traffic from the employer standpoint, parking requirements. You're going to have more sanitation requirements. So we're, we're we're putting more of a burden on the system, I think, than what we originally in, envisioned with cottage occupational uses. Uh, not sure it was intended for that. And a lot of these cottage occupations are in developments. Uh, and I think that w would be impacted to the surrounding residences. Sure. The only uh, clarification I can add is that you would additional use permits require reviewed by the Planning Commission in addition to staff and a public hearing. So at such time that you all felt that the request for two employees was above and beyond, you know, what may be uh, comfortable in a certain development or on a certain property, you could limit that or you could deny it for those reasons. Um, and I'd say, you know, uh, it's an opportunity, you know, it's a, it may be an opportunity to, you know, increase small businesses, the cottage occupation. But again, if, if you're not comfortable with it, you all need to evaluate that and I'll, I'll obviously take the comments that were made regarding concern and, and convey those should this move forward. What are the majority of our cottage occupations that, that are being conducted out there? Over the last uh, 12 to 15 months we've seen primarily daycares that those have been the ones that you all that you all have seen those would be ones where we, we would anticipate maybe the request for an additional employee um, the furniture repair one that came through um, would be another one where you know he may have sought an additional employee. Um, primarily those type of uses, um, hair, sal hair salon, nail salons, you all have seen those over the last year. Um, and you know they may want an additional employee or two. Those, are, those would be the type of uses we see. Um, yes, Mr. Kenny. Uh, Tyler, if you would please clarify that line where it says, I know we're, we're talking two persons, then it goes other than those residing on the premise. What does that actually mean? For a cottage occupation, at least one member of the cottage occupation needs to be a family member. So that, that person is living and residing on the premise and they're running a business which outside customers can come to the business. The two employees would be above and beyond the people residing on the premise. So you could potentially have four or five individuals living in the home where one or more of them works for the business plus two outside employees that don't reside on the premise that are coming to and from the cottage, the, the home every day to work at the business or in a you know, variable throughout the week. So in a scenario, there could be five people <laughs> living on, on the premise and they also could be employees? They all could also be employees plus two additional. They all could all have cars? Correct. And in areas you know, where it's maybe in the rural areas, um, you know, there's obviously challenges with the septic system and capacity and those kind of things. Obviously that would be evaluated as part of the CUP, but it's something that should be taken into consideration with this type of discussion. Sure. Another question. Have we had a lot of requests to have more than one employee? Uh, other than maybe one of the daycares last year, I'm not aware of any other requests. Um, this item was initiated by, a, through a committee member, so that's why it was discussed. Um, but it's not something that we typically see because the requirement right now is one. So everyone's coming in asking for cottage occupation and maybe one additional employee. What the reaction will be to this, if we're gonna get a big influx of people asking for two employees, I'm not, I'm not sure what that volume would look like. But the reg isn't broken, at, the ordinance isn't broken at one employee, so we, maybe we don't need to fix it to go to two. Any other comments for Mr. Klein? Thank you, sir. The next item is also an inf uh, discussion item. It's uh, the residential separation buffer waiver in the RP district, and uh, this deals with that opportunity, and Mr. Klein will help us with that. 
Yes, this is your second item up for discussion this evening. This is a proposed amendment to Chapter 165 at the zoning ordinance to allow a reduction or modification of the requirement for a residential separation buffer in the RP residential performance zoning district. This ordinance amendment was initiated by a developer request. Mr. Tweedy spoke earlier. Um, and the other, the other individual who brought this forward is also here this evening. Um, staff has drafted a revision to the zoning ordinance to allow the zoning administrator to administratively reduce and or modify the residential separation buffer required between different housing types provided that certain conditions are met. The ordinance amendment specifies the following. When an adjacent development has already installed a residential separation buffer, the zoning administrator may reduce and or modify a required residential separation buffer upon showing that the installed buffer on the adjacent property meets or exceeds all elements of a full screen buffer, including the landscaping requirement and the distance requirement, and that reducing or modifying the buffer will not negatively impact the adjacent property. The request may be made as part of a master development plan review by staff. <coughs> The Development Review and Regulations Committee discussed this amendment at length at their April and May 2017 meetings. The DRC agreed with the proposed changes and the item was forwarded to the Planning Commission for discussion. This item is pre presented for discussion this evening and staff is seeking from the Planning Commission any comments to be provided to the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Any questions? Any yeah. comments? Uh, as written, I'm not supportive of this because the adjacent development basically did all the legwork to build a buffer, and then the second person coming in may get off scot free. Uh, the other thing is, I don't see anything where it prevents reducing the, uh, I guess, the distance buffer because it doesn't specify that you're reducing, say, the landscaping. The way this is written, it would reduce. The actual buffer separation as well the setbacks uh, uh, it doesn't pertain to setbacks it would allow the zoning administrator to reduce the distance and or the planting requirement pending that the buffer on the adjacent property met or exceed uh, the buffer requirement um, in the discussion at the committee level um, we did discuss at length if we should seek uh, consent from the adjacent property owner, and it was deemed that that should not be included and that the zoning administrator should be given uh, the ability to make that determination on his, his or her own. Uh, yeah, those two items right there, the, the ability to reduce the distance, the lack of input from the adjacent, because the buffer's there for the adjacent property owner, not the county or anyone else. And for them not to be able to have any input on this, uh, to me, doesn't seem fair. I'm not in favor of this proceeding as is. Uh, I'm not sure to see it go back to committee or die at this point. Okay. Uh, Mr. Moan. Tyler, now the, the residential separation buffer, that's a 100 foot buffer, correct? It varies between 150 and 150 feet, depending on the type of screening that you do. Um, there's two parts to the buffer. There's the inactive portion and the active portion of the buffer. Um, so it would uh, you know, effectively reduce that distance provided that it's being provided off site. Um, it would not be a full waiver of a buffer requirement. We'd still require likely the plantings to be included. Um, again, it'll be a case by case basis. But this modification or waiver would only be possible when a buffer was already installed on an adjoining residential property correct okay so I, I i agree to a degree with uh with what uh supervisor or supervisor excuse me is it promoting you commissioner oates mentioned about the uh <laughs> ability to to reduce it i think you know I, I kind of agree i think we can end up with overkill on buffers sometimes i mean i i think this is going in the right direction along that line Maybe it's a putting some minimum, you know, if we allow them to reduce, but perhaps setting some minimum distance so that it's not the risk of an unintended consequence of something being completely eliminated when there should be some, I think, some shared shared input on the buffering. And then if the adjoining property owner should in the future decide to reduce their buffer, that we're still someplace where we're all happy, you know. So I think 
it might need a little bit more tweaking, but I, I think we're going in the right direction. As a point of clarification, they would still need to meet the setback requirements, so that right. does provide separation. Um, you know, s reducing the distance of the buffer doesn't reduce the distance of the setback, so that's just one point of clarification. Right, but the buffer is generally considerably more than what the setback is. Correct. The setback's generally 25 feet or something, or a buffer maybe 100. And that's what we talked about in a committee. We didn't want to be building, even though you have some land in Frederick County that has is narrow and you want to use it and you can't do it now because of the setbacks and things we didn't want somebody going in and building 15 feet from the property line because you've done away with the buffer and that's exactly what we talked about and that's what was scary about the whole thing yeah but not to mention that the, if the neighbor doesn't keep the buffer up now that's there you know these people over here that's doing the new subdivision has no control over any way to fix it because it's not on their property and I would just say too, I think we, while thinking about this, is thinking about what we're trying to achieve with the buffers. Um, residential separation buffer to me somewhat implies that different types of housing need to be separated from each other, you know, for by some significant distance. And I think we're kind of moving into a, a realm of, of planning and time and development where I'm not sure we need to worry so much about separating different housing types and we need to be thinking about how we're integrating you know some of these different housing types but at the same time the buffers still serve a role you know from an open space perspective for ensuring we get you know tree canopy you know just having that green space so there's a role for these things to play but there again it's about what's the right width in total that we want to get you know when we have these adjoining developments and it does seem like historically we've got pretty big buffers and I'm not sure people would get, you know, necessarily hurt, you know, by reducing those between housing types. But, you know, it's a very different story between different uses, obviously. Well, we used to have uh, the ability between B2, B3 when we still had a buffer between them. Uh, basically, they could enter into a joint uh, landscaping easement and shared maintenance agreement. You presented that to the zoning administrator and that get, got rid of one of the buffers altogether. Just Right. shrunk it down considerably <coughs> i'd be in favor of doing something like that but then again that's where the neighbors are working together mm -hmm. that's a good point well and <coughs> don't do this after the fact <coughs> if we are, if we have developments already built with buffers we have people that, that have bought properties with the perception that if another development is built with a different type of housing they're going to have a buffer there and I, I think we ought to go back to the, I really like the, the concept of having it agreed to by the adjacent landowners. Uh, that way they can work out, you know, what the buffer's gonna be, uh, if the new developer's gonna have to share in any maintenance of that buffer, uh, and it can be worked out there. That, that's something that shouldn't be worked out in a planning commission. <laughs> The homeowners or the homeowners associations need to work that out and i'd like to get us make sure that we're not involved with that and i think maybe the only way to do that would be have an agreement that the adjacent property owners have to agree to reduce that buffer and if that includes setting up a joint maintenance agreement they set up a joint maintenance agreement to take care of the existing buffer also like the concept of reducing it maybe 75 percent still having something there maybe not not maybe not reducing it the full 100 percent dimension but you know significantly reducing it but have an agreement between the the owners and with a maximum of the amount that it can be reduced okay i think if there's uh you know depending on the quite a few comments this evening i think staff's preference uh, would be to take it back to the committee present them with a alternative proposal let them review it and then bring it back to you all. I think that would be our preference, but obviously you all can can maybe act on it how you see fit. I'd be in favor of that. Yeah, that makes sense. In favor of that too. I think that's what we do. Thank you. Okay. Well, whatever the proposal is, I just want to make sure that the county's not a referee in this proposal. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely, and that was the debate we had. Yeah. The committee was not having the county be the middle <coughs> person. If there's notarized consent or whatever that may be. Um, so we'll take a look at some like communities and see how they're addressing it and we'll, we'll move it forward. Excellent. Thank you. 
We have one more discussion item, and that is slaughterhouses as a conditional use in the rural areas district, and that that it is uh, the thought here is to include slaughterhouses in that or in that uh, district. Yes, this is our final discussion item this evening. This is a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance to allow slaughterhouses in the RA rural areas zoning district. Currently, the manufacturing of meat products by right or is allowed in the M2 Industrial General District by right. Staff has drafted a revision to the zoning ordinance to include slaughterhouses as a conditional use in the RA zoning district. We've provided a new definition for slaughterhouses and provided additional supplemental use regulations. I will note that this was brought to our attention by a current slaughterhouse operator in Frederick County. Um, they are seeking to expand their current operation and also locate a new operation. And under the current ordinance, they are legally non-conforming use, but that places limits on their ability to, to expand. So this would be an opportunity to um, provide opportunity for business agribusiness in Frederick County. Additional supplemental use regulations for slaughterhouses would include that all buildings, animal unloading and staging areas, and animal pens shall be a minimum of 100 feet from all property lines. Total buildings square footage should not exceed 20,000 square feet. All operations must be under roof and screened from view from adjoining properties and public streets. And additional buffering and screening may be required as specified by the zoning administrator. The Development Review and Regulations Committee discussed this amendment at their April 2017 meeting and the DRC was in agreement with the proposed changes and the item was forwarded to the Planning Commission for discussion. This item is presented for the discussion this evening and staff is seeking any comments from the Planning Commission to forward this item to the Board of Supervisors. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Oates? I'm going to throw the same one out did on the uh, other one, and that's the additional screening and buffering by the Zoning Administrator. Since it's a CUP, uh, we would be at the public hearing setting up what the buffers are for the neighbors since they would be coming to the hearing. I think we should probably strike that. Okay. But I'll Anyone else think about that? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I agree with that. How, how did you arrive at the 20,000 square foot figure? Um, we were actually approached by uh, Montgomery County. They're also adding slaughterhouses as a use. Um, and they had done some research looking at Virginia localities and what their standards were. They came across our ordinance in regards to the M2 district, but when we got into discussion with them, uh, we shared that we were in the process of adding it to the RA district. The current owner of De Haven Slaughterhouses also came forward and presented kind of what the industry standard was. And within that, um, the committee agreed about 20,000 square feet would be standard. Their current operations a little under 10,000 feet and their operation that they were looking to set up would be about somewhere between 15 and 20,000 square feet. Um, it seems to be pretty consistent with other counties. Uh, we looked at Rockingham County, Fauquier County, Montgomery County, and Pulaski County. Um, I'd say we're, we're kind of right in the middle there. Um, but that, that's where we came to that standard. Um, it was really at a request of the potential end user. Um, currently, we only have two or three not legally non-conforming slaughterhouses in the county, so it's not a huge booming industry, but the, the users who are doing it um, are similar in size and scale. If I could add to that, uh, Roger, basically the, the holding pens and that type of thing takes up a lot of square footage, yeah. but we felt putting a cap on it was necessary to keep it from becoming a, an industrial slaughterhouse out in RA. We wanted to, to keep it fairly limited for rural. Any thoughts? I think we're all right. Okay. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you, Tyler. I think we're at the end of our agenda. And um, it is that we uh, do not have an agenda for June the 21st, which is when next we meet. Uh, move we cancel our 21st meeting. Second. 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 In favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Madam Chairman. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Yes. Um, I hate to do it after the item has already um, gone through, but I wanted to circle back to one of the public hearing items. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> sort of. Um, <laughs> the public hearing item that you sent forward to the board with the modified conditions for the doctor's office. Um, I wanted to circle back and give a little more clarification about um, the request that the applicant sent forward and how 
it would be impacted by the conditions and how they were changed. Um, just to clarify, the request we received was for an RP property, comp planned commercial. However, if you were to rezone it to the B2, the buffers that are implied by the ordinance would make the property not usable as B2. So they submitted the request to allow a conditional use permit for the doctor's office. So when we drafted those supplemental use regulations, the intent of condition A was for the B2 standards to apply to parking standards such as paving, striping, curb and gutter, and then perimeter and interior <coughs> landscaping. And then we had tacked on condition E um, to give the zoning administrator the ability to do buffers as he deemed fit for the property. So actually A wasn't meant to state that you you had to do, say, a 50-foot zoning district buffer, and then if the zoning administrator felt that you needed a larger buffer, it was actually meant to work the opposite way so that um, the zoning administrator, based on the property constraints and what was next to it, that they could actually reduce the buffer. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up because the way it was sent forward um, wouldn't actually meet the needs of the property that was requested for in the future. Um, Can I ask a question? It's just the further clarify. Yes, sir. So, and I was wondering that a, a little bit. So, item one or A, you know, that requires the B2 design standards. Correct. That does not include buffers. That was not meant to include buffers. Okay. So, by eliminating that, that item E. By eliminating item E, we then defaulted back to requiring the full buffer required between a B2 and an RP property, say, or a B2 and an RA with a primary residential property next to it. Or would the alternative be that they would simply be set through the CUP process? The problem by, by having A, that it must adhere to all the B2 standards, you're still going to be thrown into the buffer. So, I mean, probably an alternative would have been to tweak A to state excluding buffers it must adhere to the B2, but then still having E so that the zone administrator could set the buffer within the conditional use as a condition of what it should be, and then that would go forward to the planning commission and the board right. stating so what that necessary would buffer would be. Would it all if it's a B2 property, this ordinance wouldn't apply to it because this is for RP Correct. and RA. Correct. Due to the B2 standard. But, by, but because we added condition A so that you weren't coming in with, say, gravel um, or other site, you know, no landscaping, things like that, um, <coughs> we wanted to keep those factors to kind of push forward with the conditional use permit to be shown on the site plans since it is a commercial use. We wanted to ensure that the parking standards and the on-site landscaping standards were consistent with what someone would have to do on a commercial piece of property. However, a lot of the um, properties this would apply to, because it, say it had an existing structure on it, might not be able to meet buffer standards. Can we but simply say that at the end of A, uh, must adhere to the B2 standards, excluding buffers, which shall be determined at conditional use stage? That would be acceptable. A second. Uh, well, that's something, is that something that staff can work out with the board? since we've technically um, already acted? I mean, with that input? This body has the option, if it desires, to reconsider it at this meeting. That might be preferable just to give the board better clarity. I agree with that. I'd agree with that. And I, I agree with what, with the direction that um, Commissioner Oates was going. And my concern was just that it b needs to be done before it comes to the planning commission, not after it voted. Right, no, it, it wasn't meant that the zone administrator would then change it after the fact. It would have yeah. been s explicit within one of the conditions what the required buffer would be. And then that would be ingrained into the approved conditions. So what was those words again you used? Uh, <laughs> well, We're gonna I simply make a motion? Yeah. All right, uh, I move that at the end of A on that subject, uh, it'll be comma, excluding buffers, which shall be determined during the conditional use hearings. Good. Second. That's good. Moan, yes. Don Lap, yes. Uh, yes. Any yes. Bolden, yes. Thomas, yes. Oh, yes. Fine, yes. Andrew, Andrew yes. Andrew, 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 yes. Marston, yes. 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 And the chair votes, yes. Did we fix it? Thank you. Do we want to adjourn?
Yes. <laughs> Would somebody help us do that? Move we adjourn. Favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Chairman.